what miracle were they looking for? They saw dangerous dimensions of God. But at the slightest opportunity, they bowed to bow. They committed adultery with Ashtaroth. And the Bible has a clear description of who a thief is. Anoka is your picture I see when I read it. You are a thief. Nothing will change it. You know because within the body of Christ, we don't know the difference between contending for the faith, corrective teaching, and judging. You know, they are not the same thing, no? The Bible is clear that you should contend. It says you should be prepared. I think it's First Peter now. You should be prepared to give a defense when you are asked, why do you have this kind of hope? Jude said that you need to be, be able to earnestly to do what? Contend for the faith that was once delivered. There's a place for contending. When Paul appeared, he looked at Peter and said, Oga, this thing you are doing is wrong. You were eating with the Gentiles and then all of a sudden Jews from Jerusalem came and you are shying away. He's wrong. He didn't, he didn't do that correction in the secret. You are not here. He did that thing in public so that the Jews that came if they too were not seeing that kind of ambition, they knew that this thing that Peter did is wrong. It's not judging when you notice that there is compromise on the faith. In dealing with the matter, you are not, you are not condemning the person. You are dealing with the item that is at hand. We don't deal with individuals. What concerns us with individuals? What we deal with is the actions that the individuals engaged in. And if you don't have people that can contend for the faith, and you don't have people that can do corrective teaching, what the Bible called a teaching priest, you don't have those kind of functionaries in a generation, the city will be vulnerable. This is why currently in the body of Christ, you come and you say, why should a Christian be dancing on my piano? Somebody else within the city will come and say, and they want, they want, people, they want people to just be singing songs where they are falling under the anointing. See, dear brother, dear sister, my concern is not the song or the reading. I've taught you here before that praise and worship is not worship slow song. No. Then when you say, get in the mood of praise, then everybody will spread their legs like that. No. It's not the, what do you call it now, cleric? It's not the tempo. Uh -huh. That's the right word. It's not the tempo that classifies it as praise or worship. I've taught you here before that worship is not singing. You can sing in worship, but that you are singing does not mean you are worshiping. Worship is living, is the state of your life that flows from the composture of your heart. My concern is not the tempo. My concern is the source. The source by which spirit has this rhythm entered into the body. We should be concerned. We should be concerned. There's a, there's a teaching I listened to probably 20 years ago. It's titled Exodus into Egypt. And I listened to former hip-hop musicians share how they used to get inspiration to sing. I can't remember the name of the group now. It's so long. Right? The group, I think there are four or three of them, hip-hop musicians. They said demons, I'm quoting them, used to walk into their rooms. They used to have fraternity with demons. Somebody has that kind of experience and comes with a dance like this. 
is what he saw the demon doing. Oh, you don't, you are not understanding me. He, he had a trance. Hmm? And then saw the demon doing like this. Then he brings it in his music video. The next week is on our pulpit. You know what we do? We take a righteous song with lyrics, then put a demonic gyration. Then somebody says, eh, so, so, so the people that God is inspiring to sing a piano, to sing this, we want to drive them from the church. Wait first. Help me, Holy Ghost. So God did not see anybody within the city hmm, to give that inspiration. He first had to go and give it to a demon. Eh? Then when that demon had received it, that demon now models it to the church. It's an aberration. Nobody can bully me. It's an abomination. And if the church eh, does not wake up, we will weep like Nehemiah. And you see, just look, let's, let's use the Nigerian church as context. All the fathers from the SU movement, they are old. <laughs> Help me, Holy Ghost. They are old. You know, we're discussing in my house. Now, why is it that the revival that began in the book of Acts, it was myself, Brother Ovie, and Pastor Ogogo, the revival that began in the book of Acts has last, lasted for years. In fact, when they came under persecution in Jerusalem, everywhere they were scattered to. The Bible says they were preaching Christ. They were preaching Christ. One person is running for his life under persecution. Maybe all he carried was a leather bag with no money inside. Trekked for hours. When they get to a city, their first desire is not food or water. Is do you know Jesus? Which kind of people were these for God's sake? Under intense persecution. If it is this day, the gospel would have died. They put their needs aside. And they will stumble into cities tired. And the Bible says everywhere they went. They preached Jesus. Everywhere. They were preaching. They were speaking of Christ. The revival was like a fireball. You came into their environment, you were ignited. But read of our revivals. After five years, it dies. After two years, it dies. After one year, it dies. You know why? The minute... There was a revival, like Nigeria, for instance. The SU revival of the 70s into the 80s, early 80s. The minute that revival broke out, and many of the great men of God were born, they didn't follow the same model that was in the book of Acts. In the book of Acts, what they did was they invested the revival in men. So they built a system of training and instruction. Don't be angry with me. I know some of you are offended, but check now. Many of the great men you know, where are their sons? Uh, where? The ones that have died, where are their sons? That are working, and I'm talking not just Nigeria, the world over, that are working in the same grace and glory. Where are they? You know where they invested the revival? Human organizations. So what came out of the revival, modern day revival, is structures and denominations. What came out of the revival in the book of Acts were men of stature. And mastery. Take those men, put them anywhere. They had what the apostles had. Bro, there's no place in the Bible eh, where the Bible says, and they sat down 
and taught them. But when Philip entered Samaria, when Philip entered into Samaria, it was obvious that the same Jesus that anointed the apostles and put his hand upon them. If you say it's only Philip, it will look like a fluke. Stephen was being stoned. Stephen was being stoned. He was not an apostle. He was a common deacon. If you will permit me to use the word common. But when he was being stoned, the son of man stood up from his throne to welcome an ordinary man home. What did they teach them? What did they know? The apostles were bold to say, choose from amongst you. Don't go outside. We don't need to go outside the city to look for a piano, to look for what, whatever, to come and entertain people in the city. There are people within you, your ranks, that have something with God. They have become full of the Holy Ghost. If we try it today, you will pick men that can't control their appetite for sex. Pick people that are covering pornography with tongues. Pick homosexuals that are pastors. They are within the city. You know why? The walls are broken down. Because the walls are supposed to preserve the people. Keep life. I read through the scriptures and I will find out that Cities were prioritized because of the water that was flowing in through the city. Water. Water was a priority. And you know, every time in the Bible you see water, water is a metaphor for two things. One, the word of God. Two, the Holy Spirit. Every time the Bible speaks about water, washing is talking about the word. Every time it speaks about water, gushing or flowing is speaking about the spirit so even in eden there were four rivers four rivers that flowed and watered the garden four rivers cities prioritized their water flow so even when the prophet came they said this city is nice you look at the buildings they are beautiful he said, but the water is bitter. The rivers that are supposed to be flowing within the city are to guarantee that the men, the cattle, the children are consistently watered. But you know what we try to do? We open funnels. You know in worry when there is flood, hmm? people will bore hole at the bottom of their fence so that water will go out. Bro, the water will go out, but the integrity of the wall has been compromised. Because water can go out. It also means that certain things can what? And that wall is no longer the same. That small hole you put there looks as if it doesn't mean anything. But the integrity of that wall has been damaged. Made porous. So strange waters flow within our gardens. And then when prophets rise, see the kind of attack that my father in the Lord gets. A man came and said, if I have fornicated with any sister, please, the sister should be bold. They came and they attacked him. Not from outside the city. From within the city. Tomorrow I'm going to show you how strangers have begun to build our walls. Strangers. Our walls are supposed to be built by men like Nehemiah. Temples are supposed to be built by Ezra. We are supposed to have men like Zerubbabel. Hey guy. Prophets that can strengthen the hands of builders. But now strange men have crept in and they are mixing cement. 
they are carrying bricks. If your enemy has his agent on your inside, you will have a wall, but your wall is like nylon. Because the man on the inside will take you from the inside. Have you ever heard of something called a Trojan horse? That is how Troy conquered Greece. They sent Greece a gift. And Greece was so vulnerable. They've been looking for gift. They've been looking for opportunity to get something from Troy. And Troy sent a horse. Inside that horse, their soldiers were seated inside. Greece was so vulnerable, they could not even see beyond. May idolatry not blind the eye of the church. This is our definition of success that has made the man the center of attraction. That even men in Christian circles have elevated themselves to deity status. Men within the city will do anything for their belly. Do anything to wear a good suit. Do anything to drive a car. Huh. Satan is not joking. So there are people who bear the name of Christ. But they are within our walls to damage the work of God. To pollute our waters. And we cannot discern. What you are calling a gift calling an inspiration God is calling it an abomination an abomination the wall is not only for preservation the wall is for separation so everyone that is within the wall is considered family hmm? everyone outside the wall is an enemy the wall is for separation. So in the city, you have the children of obedience. Outside the city, you have the children of wrath, children of disobedience. We are not the same. Oga, we might be men together. If that brother is not born again, he is not in the city. Even when he is born again, if he decides to begin to live with compromise and make himself a slave of idolatry, Paul said that don't even eat with a fornicator. If it were me that said that kind of thing now, they will stone me on the streets. It's in your Bible. There are two things Paul speaks about where he asks for extreme measures. A fornicator said, Don't eat with him. A man that can't provide for him for his own home, he said, Treat him like a non believer. Born children, just give birth to children. Give birth to children give, that you cannot raise. We don't behave like that in, in Christian, in Christendom. A good man leaves an inheritance for his children. children. Go and get a girl pregnant and abandon her to raise the child. You think you have escaped. <laughs> I laugh at you. You don't know the God you are dealing with. You denied it. And then left her. She's now, she's now hiding. She had to drop out of school. Her life has become battered and bruised. She has carried shame and reproach. And then you, you are swagalicious. You are just living your life. Having a good time. To everything, there's a time and season. I know when you quote that scripture, you think about breakthroughs. Even judgment has a time and season. At the appointed time, it will find you. For whatever a man sows, he will reap. For under the heavens, there is seed time. Have you read it like that? Seed time. Harvest time. When you sow the seed, the bridge between seed and harvest is time. At the appointed time, the blades of the corn will begin to show. The leaves will begin to manifest. For every man will reap what he sows. And then the gate 
in that infrastructure is the entrance into the city. I plan to deal with gates tomorrow. So when you go to the book of Revelation, you see this metaphor of the New Jerusalem. The Bible says that the New Jerusalem is built, the walls of that city, there is a foundation. So you know that what you read is not a mistake. He said in that foundation, the 12 names of the apostles are what are written. The Bible is consistent. 12 names of the apostles are written. So this is why, dear brother, when they came and they told Jeremiah and said, the people are in distress. Let's go back to Jeremiah chapter 1 now. We're in verse 3. And the people are in reproach. Oh my God. So you know that reproach is not just shame. Reproach is not just disgrace. Are you with me? Reproach is deeper than shame. It's deeper than disgrace. Reproach is where people are now looking at you with contempt. They are looking at you like you are worthless. That's reproach. 